Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we've got another solo album review, this time of the newest project from Lana Del Rey, Chemtrails Over the Country Club. Is it gauche for me to come in here and say, I told you so, or I called it? I mean, I could show a montage of all the political subtext I've gleaned from my Lana Del Rey reviews that she herself have emphasized as not just metaphor and symbolism, but speak to her actual life and experiences as a glamorous person directly. I could highlight as early as 2014 that I was pointing this out, and that it wasn't even good melodrama, and even though seven years ago I didn't quite have the political context to delve in further, by my honeymoon review the following year, I absolutely did. These reviews, hell, indeed any of my Lana Del Rey reviews, they're among my most hated, mostly because I called out that retrograde conservative subtext. But I do think I made a mistake here, and it got sparked through a conversation I had recently with my girlfriend, who had been to a Lana Del Rey concert very early on, I think it might have been the Born to Die tour, and highlighted the strong well of empathy that she seemed to extend throughout her performance, especially to her audience. Audience. And to me, that makes all the sense in the world. One reason Lana Del Rey has been so quietly but so desperately craving a sense of sisterhood for years now and wondering why she can't be accepted in the feminist commune, it is some pretty interesting subtext. But it comes with the acknowledgement that to a lot of her audience, that connection really does exist, be it transgressive to their politics or otherwise, sometimes something they just genuinely believe. And I would argue there is more women in that latter category than you might expect. And you know, it would be profoundly shitty of me to invalidate some of that emotional experience, as I may have in the past, especially as men can find that same damn connection in certain parallel environments that seems to speak on a level that is transgressive to their politics or otherwise. You know, something they just might actually believe. But here's the thing. You can't just walk away from the rest of it. Especially when deep down, you knew all this was there all along. It's been part of her art since the very beginning, and she hasn't really been all that subtle about it. I think that might be a major reason why my reviews at the time were so broadly hated. And while in recent months, given all of the controversy surrounding everything that Lana Del Rey has said and done that show just how privileged and quasi-reactionary she is, and has always been why she's seen such a furious backlash from some of her fans. Because neither she nor I have really held back from the full story. Lana Del Rey has never been the failed liberal feminist or a grand subversion of the classic American beauty that so many have wanted her to be and projected upon her, which is why she's despised so much of the coverage that's tried to paint her as such. So I got a lot of hate from her audience when I pointed all that out, and Lana Del Rey, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I should describe this like Pitchfork did, one of America's greatest living songs writers. Same year Emily Scott Robinson put out Traveling Mercies, come on. But when she revealed her political stripes that to some have really overtaken the impact of her art, she shattered that illusion for so many of her fans, so many of the audience. Now here's the thing, this is actually not me coming down on Lana Del Rey for her politics, believe it or not. In her art, I don't think they've made for good dramatic storytelling, and there really is some dicey subtext that she's not shying away from really just implying, especially around what her brand of feminism actually is. Challenging the moralism of an ideology is very different than leaning into the systemically reinforced status quo and then you're saying you're edgy for doing so. Paul Joseph Watson and Girl Defined can't sell that and neither can you, but come on here. I've reviewed projects with far deeper and far more questionable conservative undertones and understanding and explaining emotional resonance to me, it's one of the reasons why I'm a critic in the first place. Hell, my favorite album of the entire decade of the 2010s 
Dave Cobb's Southern family, and I'm not immune to the weight of that sort of history and that sort of iconography. Make of that what you will. And you know, that was a lot of preamble going into this project. I mean, I think it's kind of needed because Lana Del Rey did a rather thorough job nuking her reputation from orbit in 2020, especially coming off of 2019's Norman fucking Rockwell, where I would actually agree with a lot of critics that it was her best album since Born to Die and showed her writing with a lot more nuance and flavor. A little bit more grounded reality and a bit of wisdom does a solid job adding some foundation to all of your dreams. But that did leave some open questions for me. I had not heard any of the singles for this new project. I knew it was surrounded by a lot of controversy and some very defensive statements throughout a lot of the promo run. I saw a Wise Blood collaboration for a Joni Mitchell cover on the final song and that just made me laugh hysterically if only for some of those implications. And given that she was bringing back all the same team as before, especially Jack Antonoff, I was encouraged that it seemed like it would at least be shorter. But all right, after all of that, what did we get with Chemtrails Over the Country Club? Well, uh, this was thoroughly underwhelming. I mean, I hate to say this, folks, but after a year of putting her foot in her mouth, Chemtrails Over the Country Club might be one of Lana Del Rey's most meekly inoffensive projects that she's ever released. I'm dead serious about that. I was thinking I would have a lot more to say, that I might not even do a solo review, and yet... Really, this was the sort of come down I should have expected. But after Norman fucking Rockwell and her rather eventful 2020, an album with such a contentious title doesn't feel like it prompts anything close to the blowback. I know some people will hurl against it because they got an axe to grind. But as someone who has come down really hard on her in the past when it wasn't cool, I'm not sure there's enough here to earn it. I mean, it certainly doesn't match any of the hype, and in comparison with her controversy, I can't imagine this being more of a blip on a lot of people's radars. I'm not sure how long this will last. And as such, it's not me saying this is good. It might be shorter than her last project and less immediately insufferable than Ultra Violence or Honeymoon. But beyond that, it feels weirdly inert to me. A little bit unsurprising. An artist returning to a formula that I would argue was running dry at least two albums ago, especially as her sound and approach has lost a lot of its uniqueness in recent years. There's even more people trying to follow this formula that she didn't even originate. But more to the point, this has a what now? Now feel, which is actually not uncommon for singer-songwriters who make their grand, overwhelming thesis statements about their process and their country and everything in between. I mentioned this when I covered God's Favorite Customer by Father John Misty way back in 2018, where normally the next step in the career is the Come Down project that results in a smaller scale existential crisis that may be nevertheless as real. And the Come Down is absolutely here, but it feels like a more of a retreat to her formula Formula and where the cracks are starting to show through. What immediately caught me off guard came with some of the song construction. Forget the awkward drum solo that was tacked onto the end of the title track. For someone who was previously all about the languid flow and setting all those vibes, I got to admit it's kind of weird to hear Lana Del Rey cram words into the poetic meter and show a level of clumsiness that you would not expect as a poet, even if it's attempting to convey some youthful exuberance, and especially as it's a an awkward fit with her return to a lot of baby voice cooing that I have never liked because she's never had the breath control to do it all that well. And that's right from the first song, White Dress, arguably one of the worst tracks here. It then creeps into Wild Heart where the clunky construction does not remotely convey wildness, even if I do like the vocal multi-tracking. And yeah, it's all over Yosemite as well. And I don't think this is helped by certain production choices where you can just tell Jack Antonov was trying to add some pop touches, some hints of gloss, the same way he did for other artists, and I gotta say, it doesn't really fit with the attempted vibe. Does anyone else think those auto-tune touches on the vocals of Tulsa Jesus Freak worked for the stormy, backwoods feel of the song? Or how the vocal fidelity will change like three or four different times on Dark But Just a Game and it feels really out of place? Or why the hell they left the studio chatter in, not all who wander are lost, especially as 
once again, the vocal tracking and harmonies are probably the best parts of that song. You can just tell, again, that Jack Antonov was trying to add a little bit more clarity and color to a lot of these compositions, but sad to say, you can also tell the instrumentals were just nowhere near as ornate or as interesting as the last project. Less sweep, less elegance, far less momentum. I guess some people might call it more subtle, but more spare pianos and guitars that are devoid of interesting texture lying flat in the mix that has nothing close to the misty swell you'd find in Dream Country or the Bakersfield Sound, the latter of which has been an influence for years on her, has never felt fully realized. A lot of these tunes on their own feel really underwhelming. Yeah, some languid touches of horns and Mellotron slip onto Dance Until We Die, where she tries to ramp up into one of the more upbeat grooves that she's ever had for a bridge, and not only does her voice have to be pushed back in the mix to avoid how she can't remotely sell that, the mix, it can't even sell how timid it all feels. It's just really wonky and strange. Now, granted, for those of us who know the very obvious influences from which Lana Del Rey is drawing from in the 60s and the 70s, her presentation, this sort of vibe, it's not nearly as unique as it's been framed. I brought this up before, but at this point you really can't avoid it. Apologies in advance, because this is going to set off a firestorm in the comments, but ever since Wildest Dreams, Taylor Swift has been making Lana Del Rey songs off and on for the past several years, and especially coming off of folklore and evermore from a compositional standpoint in terms of the writing, the delivery, and melody... At least for me, she's been better at it. And it's not a comparison that comes out of nowhere. Both artists delve into the same brand of vintage Americana with a lot of breathy vocals, the stories about lonely, complicated women living within patriarchal systems, and they're now being produced by Jack Antonoff, and both would acknowledge the other's influence on each other. But in recent years, I'm gonna say it, Taylor Swift brought a level of refinement, songcraft, and cut to raw nerves for me in a way that Lana Del Rey never really has, out for some isolated moments. I'll dig into why a little bit later, but for now I'll just point at champagne problems and tolerate it and I mean, just move on. But that is an incidental parallel. What gets weird is that Lana Del Rey actually invites several of these comparisons by including Zella Day and Wiseblood on the final song of the album, gives Wiseblood the final verse, and it's legit startling how much more rich her vocal timbre really is, which creates that magnetism that made all the critics lose their shit over Titanic Rising in 2019. I talk about the importance of ending a project properly all the damn time, and ending with a voice that is not your own and is might be better at your own style, it feels like a major misstep, especially as it confirms what I've been pointing out for years, that if you look just a little bit away from the mainstream, there are more than a few acts who do this sort of retro approach in a way that has worked better for me. Hell, thank God Julia Holter or any number of women in indie country aren't here, or we'd actually have some real competition. Or let me put it like this. Like on previous projects, it's not good when the best song in your album is a cover and the best parts are not being sung by you. But alright, a lot of this production, a lot of this approach, it was designed to center the content and the lyrics. This is my specialty. And you know what? I gave Lana Del Rey a lot of credit last time when her writing finally picked up a step to maybe not subvert the effortlessly wealthy, idyllic, waspy story she was telling, but deepen them, add some moral complexity, deepen her own character, show some maturity. Sadly, this album doesn't try anywhere near that hard. Lana Del Rey is back in her blissed out comfort zone, comfortably swaddled in white retro Americana, which as a Canadian, I just gotta say it from the outside looking in, always just makes me shake my head with some weary amusement. And going further here, where we actually get even less of the darker, modern juxtaposition that added shades of complexity to her best songs. It's legit kind of shocking. You'd think she would have leaned into it, to the point where I wonder if there was some label interference on this album where there might have been way more darkness than was implied, but given how often she stumbled into controversy that decided to yank her out of the skid, might explain some of the delays too. And thus we wind up with Lana Del Rey songs that don't just feel undercooked 
and derivative of what she's put out before, but don't really evoke much more beyond a feeling of settling down and preservation for as many years as she might have. Getting out of the fast-paced, hard life of LA, settling down in middle American suburbs which she paints over with a gauzy film that really only feels representative of some very specific, very whitewashed, gated communities, but she's no longer being the candle in the wind, eaten alive by the industry, devoured by the paparazzi and the journalist, which is referenced both on the rough-and-tumble implications of Tulsa Jesus Freak and far later on Yosemite. Hell, given what Candle in the Wind started off as in its tribute to Marilyn Monroe in the 70s and then became in the mid-90s, and how she references paparazzi triggering a car crash on Wild at Heart, is so much of this an extended Princess Diana illusion? One of the many attempts of Lana Del Rey to write herself into history as a tragic but loving heroine? I can see the appeal for her, but this is where the album reveals a massive shortcoming, and while I found her closing cover so amusing at first glance, because with women like Joni Mitchell, Princess Diana, Marilyn Monroe, a lot of the stature in culture was rooted in complicated expressions of womanhood that didn't fit cleanly into any feminist box at the time and now, but they at least in some ways placed themselves against the power structure that be and they paid dearly for it. It goes back to what I said at the very start, and why I really struggle to buy into a lot of her claims that she's wild at heart or has these ever-present feelings of wanderlust, when the rest of the actual text indicates she wants to settle down in her burgeoning love of America, and then love this problematic guy and this problematic nation in her story for as long as she can. In other words, she hasn't really budged in her convictions since at least Honeymoon. I was pointing this out in 20 2015. None of this is surprising. She's back in territory we've heard countless times before. But you know what? There may actually be a bit of an exception here, and it actually requires a bit of history that I can provide. And it circles around the song Breaking Up Slowly, featuring the uncredited vocals of Nikki Lane, who the first time I heard it, wow, it sounds like Miley. Now, this song has Lana Del Rey singing from the perspective of Tammy Wynette, who was a country singer in the late 60s and throughout most of the 70s, and was part of a power couple with fellow country legend George Jones. Now, their marriage was a mess. George Jones has openly referenced in his music that he believed it was doomed, then Tammy Wynette herself eventually ended it, and the wild series of events that would actually follow her, it's one of the great, sad tragedies of that era in country. And hell, Tammy Wynette is most well known for Stand By Your Man, one of her biggest hits, and a song that, regardless of how sarcastic it can be interpreted, it does kind of fit alongside Lana Del Rey's worldview, especially where she's trying to cling to that relationship however long it it might last. It's breaking up, but it's doing it slowly. Now, she's at least mature enough to accept the fact that it is actually ending and not trying to sell forever, but not because she wouldn't want it. And again, it feels like the stakes that Lana Del Rey is trying to sell for herself are misaligned from the women that she idolizes and the systems in which they lived and the positions they took with respect to those systems. And to quote Tammy Wynette herself, the sad part about happy endings is that there's nothing to write about. Now, I can actually empathize with Lana Del Rey's anxieties about the transience of beauty and purity, hence the persistent whiteness of all the symbolism, and how women are valued based upon appearance and beauty in male-dominated spaces and patriarchy. Now, I think Mish Way of White Lung did the sort of examination way more effectively back on Paradise five years ago. Different conversation, but... You'll never hear even an acknowledgement that the systems can be challenged, that they can be changed. Her individual tragedy comes with living in that system, which gives her enough glamour that she's really not about to pull away or protest that hard. And that's been her arc for years now. In art and what she says in the public, a story of individual privilege that will read as reactionary and conservative even when she tries to avoid the branding. That's what happens when you wrap yourself in that sort of nationalist nostalgia so thoroughly. And to bring it all full circle, it's why Taylor Swift's approach to this territory and sound actually works for me, even with all the parallels. Because especially on her recent albums, she's also noticed just how easily she could slip into that same idyllic American old money with all the status and glamour to match. And while she will admit the allure, because it's there, 
More often than not, she chooses to walk away from all the champagne problems. Be the mad woman who sits on the outside looking in, having a marvelous time ruining everything. Which is why from her, it's believable. There's drama. To quote another great songwriter, she makes it seem real. But here's the thing. For as harsh as everything I just said might have been, this isn't a bad album. It's middle of the road for Lana Del Rey. Not her worst, not her best. Certainly a come down release, but it's really too insubstantial in terms of its presentation to spark any real emotions in me, positive or negative. Questionable intentions executed questionably. In a bizarre way, it does kind of remind me of another country album, 2018's The Mountain by Dirks Bentley, which you could tell by the end was a bit of a swan song for him, slowing down, stepping out of the mainstream for a bit. And that's honestly what I might expect coming from Lana Del Rey after this with The Mountain and Evermore. I don't think we're gonna get a new Lana Del Rey album after this for some time and she might be better for it. But I also expect mostly because whenever Dirks Bentley slips out he's gonna go off and do his own weird shit like neo-traditional country comedy albums and I'm not sure I could see Lana Del Rey doing that even if that could be something to behold and I now kind of want to hear it. Maybe that's why she brought Zella Day and Wiseblood on to For Free to keep the flame a little bit while her interest wanders as she claims she is want to do. I mean, it's kind of pompous and I don't think this album can remotely pull off that exchanging of the guard, but I see the intent. And again, it calls back to some of that yearning for sisterhood. I don't see acknowledged coming from her enough. Really, it's been all over, even her most problematic statements. But overall, you know, the fans are going to adore this, as per expected. But if you were a fan looking to be won back after Lana Del Rey's eventful last year, I gotta say it, I'm not sure there's enough to pull you back. For me, it's a light 5 out of 10. She's done more with this material before, and it's just too sleepy and forgettable. The stand is more of a footnote of her larger story, at least for now. But if you're curious, it's not bad. You can give it a listen. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I do think I was more charitable in this review than I've been in many a Lana Del Rey review. Maybe I'm getting better at this. Maybe I think uh, some people are catching up with where I am. Again, it'd be very easy for me to gloat and say I told you so, especially for as far left as I am to point all this out. But in reality, I'm not going to say I've got sympathy for this, but I get it a little better, and I think that helps. So hey, if you guys want to debate all that, have fun in the comments below. Anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to actually get involved in supporting my channel, maybe getting albums onto my schedule, link to my Patreon right over there. Again, please don't feel obligated. Tough times out there for everybody, even if you're in a certain little whitewashed areas, but Hey, if you want to throw me money along the way, maybe get into my Discord so you can engage me in debate directly, have fun. But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.